Well, praise God, the day of the Lord draws near. I think we can all say amen to that. Amen. Well, how do you follow Jacob? <laughs> oh, there you go. So, <laughs> praise the Lord. So, you've, you, you've had uh, Jacob's ministry, so now we're going to just dumb it down, really. <laughs> Praise God. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 2. And as you do that, I'd like, to, I'd like you to join me in prayer for myself. Uh, it's 4 o'clock in the morning back in South Africa. We arrived yesterday after 30 hours of flying in airports. So you might say I'm somewhat jet-lagged. And right now, I'd rather be sleeping. So... <laughs> I need, as much, I need as much grace as the Lord is willing to give. Father God, we bless you, Lord, for the theme of this, of this uh, conference. My Lord, you would have us be alert and awake at this time in history. Oh, my God, that, that which is written in your word, your soon coming, my God, is being fulfilled in our days. We see the signs, my Lord, that were spoken of by your prophets, Lord thousands of years ago, coming to pass in our day. Lord, awaken us to righteousness. Cause us to be alert. Cause us to be watchful. Father, give us ears that hear and hearts of understanding. Lord, as I stand before my brothers and sisters, I ask for your grace, for your quickening, Lord, that I may speak with accuracy your word. My Lord, but in all things, instruct us, prepare us, that we would all individually one day hear the accolade, well done, thy good and faithful servant. So, Lord, be with us, lead us. Oh, God, let this we can not just be teachings, but, Lord, divine appointments. Will you deal with us individually, you deal with us corporately. But, my God, raise up a people that will take your gospel, Lord, to a dying world. Have your way amongst us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I've been asked, what is the title of my message? Well, I'm, Jacob and I each are going to be sharing four messages over the course of the weekend. And my message is really an introduction to the day of the Lord. Just for those who kind of at my level, this is for us. The rest of you, just go with Jacob's teaching. Right, 2 Peter chapter 2, and we take up from verse 4. In 2 Peter, the apostle is dealing with false brethren and false prophets and false teachers that had come into the church and would intensify. And he brings his teaching into the subject of the day of the Lord. So I want to start in, at verse 4 of chapter 2, and I just want to say, possible, thank you, brother. I cannot tell you what a joy it is to have a pulpit that you can actually see your Bible. It's not a, way down there. <laughs> For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling amongst them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds." Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. The day of the Lord is an event. An event that will ultimately bring an end to unrighteousness upon the earth. Now Jacob in, in his first talk to tonight told us that prophecy needs to be understood with a Hebraic mindset. In other words, unlike the Hellenistic understanding of prophecy where there's a prophecy and there is a fulfillment 
or I should say there's a prophecy and there's the fulfillment. The Bible clearly illustrates that God, when He speaks about a future event, oftentimes speaks about the event, and there are other events that mimic what God has said, but they are not the ultimate fulfillment. Now I'm going to drop a bombshell on you. The day of the Lord, as you understand it, is a type of the ultimate day of the Lord. Now, I say this, I'm in esteemed company, and I know I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, so I ask you just bear with me. As Jews, we normally make what seems to be a, pros- a preposterous statement, and then spend the rest of the evening trying to confirm it from Scripture. We are all expecting the day of the law that will begin at the rapture of the church. Saints, this is merely a type. It is a fulfillment of the day of the Lord. It's not the fulfillment. The day of the Lord culminates when all unrighteousness is eternally dealt with. Now, having said that, Peter talks about the day of the Lord in light of, he talks about the days of Noah, that Noah was saved from a wicked generation. In like manner, Lot was saved from a wicked generation. When Jesus speaks about his coming, he says his coming will be like the days of Noah. It will be like the days of Lot. If you and I are to understand events that will surround and ultimately lead to the next fulfillment of the day of the Lord, we must study very carefully the lives and the society at the times of both Noah and Lot. And during the course this weekend, I'm sure this will come up. But I want us to now go to chapter 3 of Second Peter and read from verse 1. Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminders that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, All things continue as though they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. Speaking about the times of Noah. The scoffers in these days have forgotten how God dealt with the generation of Noah. How God dealt with the wicked. That is the problem with mankind. We do not learn from history. We do not learn from our own history and we do not learn from biblical history. Peter continues and he says in verse 7, but the heavens and the earth which are now, this is this creation, this which has survived, this which is now replaced the world of Noah, this creation, these heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire. The next word in the Greek, ace, into or onto the day of judgment. This creation, this current world, is being reserved by God for the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, verse 8, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. God is only going to deal with mankind for seven days. That's all he's got. He's only got time for us for seven days. It was two days from Abraham, sorry, from Adam to Abraham, another two days from Abraham to Jesus, and we're about coming to the end of another two days. That's six days or 6,000 years, and there's one day, a Sabbath, that must follow. Seven year reign of Christ, sorry, the thousand year reign of Jesus. 
Seven days, 7,000 years. The Bible tells us in verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all shall come to repentance. Thank God for His mercy and grace. Amen. Could you imagine if God came 20 years ago? How many of you have been saved less than 20 years? Well, thank God. Thank God that He's long-suffering and patient, not willing that any should perish. We want the Lord to return, and praise God, we cry out from our spirit, Maranatha, O Lord, come. Our hearts groan and yearn to, be, to take off this corrupt tent and to put on that which is immortal to walk free of the sin nature, to be in the presence of God, to ultimately know Him who knows us. Yet because of God's mercy and God's grace, He delays His coming. Thank God for His grace. Verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up. The day of the Lord will come. Yeah. And this creation will be destroyed. It will be replaced. Verse 11, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, Peter asks the question, What manner of persons ought you to be? Or literally, of what sort? ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness. You see, during the, this weekend, we're going to focus on events that are, are going to lead up to the day of the Lord. And I'm sure we're going to be looking at things, or either myself or Jacob, we'll be looking at things regarding the rapture, the timing of the rapture, the rise of the Antichrist, how the, one, how the world is coming together to form a one-world government, how persecution against us is going to increase in light of all the things that we're going to hear this weekend, the Spirit of God asks us, what manner of person ought you to be? In holiness and godliness. You see, we are going to get a lot of knowledge, and it's good. We need to know the things that are unfolding. It is imperative that we are aware. We never discount knowledge, but we add Knowledge to our faith. Isn't that what Peter says in the first chapter of this epistle? And so, in light of all that we're going to learn, never lose sight that God is looking for a people who are holy and godly. Verse 12, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Saints, is this your home? Is this where you dig your roots? Or does your heart yearn for a land beyond this? Because you and I need to be focused on that which is above not that which we walk on. We thank God for His goodness, and God is a God of goodness, a God who blesses. Oh, it went silent all of a sudden. You, thought I'd, you think I'm going to go charismatic on you? Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things, the things of life. Not our greeds, but our needs God provides. God is faithful and God is good. Amen. You read the Old Testament, and there are a few things you can conclude. God blesses those who love Him, and God judges those who hate Him. Though God bless us, though we live lives of, 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 of peace and His goodness, this is not our home. Never lose sight of eternity. Never lose sight of your calling. You have been adopted by He who is beyond description, Amen. who dwells in unapproachable light, whose glory is beyond our understanding, who spread out the heavens by His own will. And there are things too magnificent, too mind-boggling for us to comprehend. Amen. It is He who has adopted you. There are so many things that 
God is going to show us, we're going to know that this world pales into insignificance. This creation is doomed. But that's all right. Because we look to the one yet to come. Verse 14, therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. Being saved is the beginning of the journey of redemption. Unless a man be born again, he will not see the kingdom. Being born again is not the kingdom. Being born again is the gateway to the kingdom. It's the departure lounge to the kingdom. We need to be found faithful and endure to the end. But saints, this is not the kingdom. Thank God for His salvation. Thank God for the joy He gives us. Thank God for His peace. Thank God for the nearness of His Spirit. Thank God for all His benefits, but this is not the kingdom. Like an old Jewish man says, it gets gooder and gooder. And this is just good. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by Him in peace without spot and blameless, and consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the Scriptures." When it comes to the things of doctrine, there are always those who will twist. But verse 17, you therefore, beloved, in spite of all that's happening, in spite of false doctrine, in, false, in spite of false teachers, in spite of a looming destruction of this world, therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness. Beware. It is good to be alert, but when we focus on what is happening in Satan's kingdom, we quickly lose sight of what's happening in God's kingdom. It is good to be aware. It is good to be alert. It is good to know what is transpiring. And thank God that there are many, many Christian ministries that keep you up to date with what's happening. But don't lose sight of your own steadfastness. And I believe, and I don't know, it's, we'll worry about tomorrow's session tomorrow. But perhaps this is where I'll probably be speaking from. It's our spiritual state in these times. Verse 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever and ever. My heart's desire, and I believe it's the Lord's heart's desire, my heart's desire is to go and rent out deck chairs on a tropical island. That's my heart's desire. So God's heart's desire is that you and I grow in the knowledge of our Lord and grow in God's grace in the midst of a world being prepared for God's judgment. Are you hearing what I'm saying, saints? Because many of us are growing lukewarm. Many of us are becoming cold of heart because we are so fixated on what Satan's doing, and we do not incline our hearts to hear what God's doing by His Spirit. We don't open up our Bibles to read what God has to say about these end times. These days have not overtaken God. Praise the Lord. So, what is the day of the Lord? Well, the day of the Lord is the final judgment of God on all the ungodly who have ever lived. The heavens, this universe, and the earth will be obliterated. I was trying to find a strong word because destroyed just doesn't cut it. It's going to be annihilated. It's going to be obliterated. And new heavens and a new earth on which God will dwell. On which God will dwell. Because the city of heaven, that which is outside this creation, as we heard earlier this evening, will come 
literally from where it has been from eternity past. Did you get that? From where it has been from eternity past. And this city where God dwells in all His glory is going to come onto a recreated earth and you and I will be with God forever. Come, Lord Jesus. The days of Noah and Lot are examples of what the day of the Lord will be like. We have much to glean from these examples. And ultimately, God will deliver the righteous from His wrath, but destroy the wicked in His wrath. The day of the Lord, God will deliver the righteous from His wrath as he did with righteous Noah, and as he did with righteous Lot. You and I are spared from the wrath of God, but the wicked will incur the full wrath of his rage. Some scriptures on the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is not something to be looked forward to by the unsaved. Isaiah in chapter 13 verse 6 says, Wail, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Amos chapter 5 and 18 says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. For what good is the day of the Lord to you? It will be darkness and not light. Joel chapter 2 verse 31, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a fearsome thing. And as we read just now in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the elements will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up. Every time we read about the day of the Lord, and there are many scriptures, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, that speaks about the day of the Lord, and always speaks about judgment and destruction. The righteous spared, but those who are wicked will come under the judgment and the wrath of a living, righteous, holy God. Joel says in chapter 3, verse 11 through 16, Assemble and come, all you nations. The judgments of God, the day of the Lord, ultimately is a judgment against all nations. And gather together all around. Cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. Let the nations be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. I love that. Put in the sickle. We see that imagery of a harvest being reaped in Revelation 14. The first image we have is of Christ on a white horse with a golden sickle, and he reaps his harvest. That speaks of the rapture, and directly thereafter comes another reaper to reap the wicked, to cast them into the fury of the wrath of the living God. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the winepress is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will grow dark and the stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord also will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and earth will shake. But the Lord will be a shelter for his people and the strength of the children of Israel. The imagery always is judgment upon the wicked, salvation. For the righteous. Now there have been four shadows or types of the day of the Lord in the past. Let's look at them. The day of Noah and the worldwide flood. Jesus says that his coming will be likened unto. That was a judgment where God entered into judgment with humanity. Saving eight. Lord alone knows how many perished. Days of Lot and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. A type, a type of the day of the Lord. But the destruction of Jerusalem was prophesied as the day of the Lord. As we learned 
Early on this evening, one prophecy, multiple fulfillments. When we read Joel, Joel is prophesying both to a near future, the destruction of Jerusalem under Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, and ultimately the fulfillment of the day of the Lord at the end of the age. That's the third. This time we see Noah. It was a global judgment. With Sodom and Gomorrah, it was a local. And with Jerusalem and Nebuchadnezzar, it was local. And Jerusalem destroyed, and God entering into judgment against Israel for rejecting their Messiah at the time of the first century. A type of the day of the Lord. Two types have passed. Two are to come. The one we're most interested in, of course, is the one that takes place towards the end of Daniel's 70th week. And probably that's what we're going to be focusing on because that's the one that have, pertains to us. We want to get that one sorted out before we worry about the ultimate one. Would you agree? Yes. Praise the Lord, because the Bible says if we are not taken in the rapture, or if we do not die before the rapture in Christ, and we do not partake in the first death, then we will partake in the second death. We will be twice dead. In South Africa, there's a saying amongst the African people when they're trying to really emphasize that somebody is really dead. You, know, you can get shot once and you're dead. But you know, when you're shot with an RPG, then they say, hey, sure, hey, 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 he's dead, dead. <laughs> That's twice dead. The Bible, they, they that's actually scriptural. Woe is he who does not partake in the first resurrection, d dead once and raised. But woe is he who dies outside of Christ, because you don't just die physically, but you are dead and condemned eternally. The first, the first next fulfillment, how's that for good English? We see in Revelations 8, 9, 15, 16, it's the trumpet judgment, the bold judgment, events that are clearly spoken of in the book of Revelation. But the ultimate fulfillment of the day of the Lord is when after the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, when Satan is let loose from his imprisonment, and he goes and deceives the nations, the nations who have lived under the rulership of Jesus Christ. They've lived under righteousness, and they've lived under the peace of God when multitudes join the, sat the satanic rebellion. God enters into judgment one final time with mankind. Never to judge man again. And at that time, we know from Revelation chapter 20, that God will dissolve this creation. And after... 7,000 years, that which God created in Genesis chapter 1 will, for a period, cease to exist. And then he recreates a new heaven and a new earth, cleansed by fire. All remnant of sin dealt with, and a holy God can come into a holy creation and be amongst the holy people. That is just an overview of what we're going to be looking at. The day of the Lord. What is it? Simply, it is when God enters into judgment with mankind, sparing the righteous, but bringing His wrath upon the wicked. Now, many of you know the difference between wrath and tribulation. Now, unfortunately, in the church... There is great division regarding the timing of the rapture. It is not my desire to further add to that division. But it's important for us to understand the difference between the wrath of God and the tribulation of the unsaved led by the enemy. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, remember, I'm just giving you an overview. Today, 
Tonight is my introduction to what I'll be sharing over the course of this weekend. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 through 11, we can read that, but I want to focus on this, just for the next few moments, on verse 9. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, again well known by most of you, the Apostle Paul writes in verse 1, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Why do you think that they had no need that Paul write to them regarding the end of the age and the day of the Lord? Why do you think they had no need? Well, praise the Lord, brother. He had already told them. There was no confusion in the early church. There was no debate. Everyone knew exactly when the rapture would take place. Not the day, but the season. Was it going to be pre, mid, post, intraseal? They all knew. They knew the right answer. And so do some of us. Moving on. <laughs> Verse 2. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Now how many of us fully understand what Paul's saying? The day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Which means you and I have no clue when it's going to happen. Right? Wrong. Let's read. Praise God. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. When they say peace and safety, who's looking for peace and safety? The world. Who knows there'll never be peace and safety until the Prince of Peace comes? We do. We do. So when they say peace and safety... Then sun destruction comes upon them as a thief in the night. You see, we know the season. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour, but we certainly know the season. We know that when the temple in Jerusalem begins to be rebuilt, when the Jews are once more allowed to make sacrifice, we know we've entered Daniel's 70th week. We know the season. Now you and I can squabble over roughly five or six years. For the pre-tribbers, right? It's going to happen immediately. For the mid-tribbers, mid-trib mid, uh, guys, <laughs> it's three and a half years difference. For those of us who know the truth, <laughs> maybe another year and a half on top of that. Let's face it, we're squabbling over six years, give or take. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness. Do you see the distinction that Paul makes? There is them and there is you. They are looking for peace and safety. We are looking for his return. They do not know the signs of the times. We know what to look for. There's the thems and there's the us's. You, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day, the day of the Lord, should overtake you as a thief. He comes as a thief in the night for the unsaved. He comes as a thief in the night for those who are not looking. But for those who know the season, He does not come as a thief in the night. And who says that? Paul by the Spirit. Praise the Lord. Amen. Verse 5. You are all sons of light and sons of the day you're not of the night nor of the darkness therefore let us not sleep as others do but let us watch and be sober for those who sleep sleep at night and those who get drunk are drunk at night but let us who are of the day be sober putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation for god did not appoint us to wrath God did not appoint us to wrath. And as verse 9 on the screen, the word wrath there in the Greek is the Greek word orge. It is vengeance. It speaks of God's wrath. It is judgment. You and I are not appointed to the wrath of God. 
So when we read the book of Revelation and the angels begin to sound the trumpets of the wrath of God, you and I are not appointed to that. We are not partakers of that and we do not come under the judgment of God. We do not come under the bold judgments. We are not appointed to wrath. Just like Noah was not appointed to wrath. If we want to understand the day of the Lord and events that lead up to it and events that happen around it, we need to understand how God dealt with Noah and how God dealt with Lot. Are you hearing me, saints? Noah was warned of impending destruction and judgment. And God gave him the way of escape. Build an ark. The Lord sends his two angels to Lot, warning him of impending destruction. Get out. God does not appoint the righteous to Orge. He does not appoint his righteous, his children, to his wrath. Is this clear? Praise the Lord. In some churches, I'd have been kicked out by now. <laughs> Colossians chapter 3, verse 6. Because of these things, the wrath, the orge of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. God's judgment is coming upon those who disobey. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. Paul says, and to wait... For his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the orge, the judgment, the wrath, the vengeance of God, which is to come. But tribulation is something different. Jesus promised us this in John chapter 16, verse 33. These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Where does your peace come from? Jesus. Your peace does not come from the circumstances that you go through. Brothers and sisters, are you hearing me? If you are seeking peace in life outside of you and God, if you're looking for peace in your home, you're looking for peace at work, you're peace in the family, peace in your city, peace in your town, in your nation. If you're looking for peace outside of your relation with Jesus Christ, you have no guarantee of finding it. In fact, you're not going to find it. In me, says Jesus, you will have peace. In the world, outside of our relationship with Jesus Christ, you will have peace. Ellipsis, you will have tribulation, you will have trouble, you will have persecution. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Amen. I'll show you who to fear, says Jesus. Do not fear man who, after he's killed the body, can do nothing more, even if you are dead, dead. But fear God, because not only can God take your life, He can send you for eternity into the torments of hell. Be of good, good cheer. What's the worst they, could, they can do to you? I live in South Africa. It's the most beautiful country in the world. Pastor Bulls has been there, and Kristen and, and Jacob. It's, it is stunning. It is an unbelievably beautiful country. You can be killed by more things in South Africa than any place in the world. We have the fiercest animals you can believe. We have the nastiest snakes that you can imagine. We've got spiders that'll kill you and scorpions that'll kill you. We have our countrymen who'll kill you. We live in a violent, violent society. Things can turn from normal to a war zone instantly. There is not a South African who hasn't been affected by a murder. This is how we live. And people say, well, aren't you scared? Aren't you worried? Well, I say, what's the worst that can happen? Well, you could get killed. 
One day I'm going to preach a sermon called Christians Need to Learn How to Die. <laughs> Tell you they can kill you. Hmm. <laughs> I'm going to stick around. <laughs> You've got to overcome the world. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 4. But in fact, we told you before, we were with you, that we would suffer tribulation. Philipsis. Just as it happened. And you know. Revelation. John writes in the first chapter, I, John, both your brother and companion, in the tribulation, the Philipsis, and the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Revelation 7, 14. The saints that were persecuted... And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These, these saints that are under the altar are the ones who come out of the great thelipsis, the great tribulation, not the great wrath of God. The wrath of God has not yet been poured out. These are those that come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. When we look at definitions around the day of the law, we need, to under, we need to know that there is a complete separation and distinction between tribulation that Christians have been facing from the day the church began and will continue to face until the Lord comes back for His bride. This is the Greek word thelipsis. It is persecution. It is a result of two kingdoms colliding. That's right. There has been an invasion in Satan's kingdom. He is the God of this world, but the God of all gods and the King of all kings and the Lord of every Lord has cut into his kingdom Amen. with his own kingdom. God. And there has been a war ever since. And you and I are in this war, and in any war there are casualties. Some of us will suffer hardship. Some of us will be called to pay the ultimate price. This is not God's wrath. The Bible tells us in the Psalms that God rejoices over the death of His righteous of his saints. For then they have ceased from their struggles in this world and have entered into glory. We will have tribulation. And the more you want to walk after the Lord, the closer you want to draw to Jesus, the more you want to be involved in the things of God, the more tribulation you are going to face. Amen. But be of good cheer because he's overcome the world. And as Paul writes to Jesus, who for the, sh for the glory... That awaited him. He despised the shame of the cross. He went to the cross. No, it wasn't easy. He sweated blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. But he looked beyond the cross to the glory. And that's how you and I are called to walk. Look beyond the politics of this nation. Look beyond the erosion of the Judeo-Christian valleys in which this nation was established. Look beyond it. Look to the glory, because if you're going to focus on this world, you will have no peace and you'll be overcome. Right. As a thief in the night, we've dealt with that. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon. We're going to learn many things over this weekend. Many things are going to be shown us. I'm going to, the scripture is going to be expounded for us. That we have no excuse not to be alert. Alert to false doctrines. False prophets. Alert to what the governments of the world inspired by Satan are up to. We will be alert. But the question that is going to be asked in the light of all this, in the light of the imminency 
of the day of the Lord, the question that the Spirit of God asks us, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? I do not believe that this is the church. And by saying this, I'm not saying you. I'm saying us. The remnant church. I do not believe this is the state that Christ wishes us to be found in when he returns. Say that slowly. How the church is, I'm talking about the remnant church. I'm talking about those who seek after truth. I'm not talking about those who are in error. I'm addressing those who desire to be found faithful at his return. Us, we, are not as we ought to be. Now, that isn't encouraging in a certain degree but very encouraging another because God has to do something in His remnant. And I rejoice in that, that this is not the end, that God is going to revive His remnant because He's coming back for a glorious bride. He's coming back for people without spot, and without blemish, made clean through His blood, sanctified by His Spirit. And this is what excites me. This is what keeps me from selling up and opening up a deck chair biz business on some deserted island. Because I look at what the Scriptures say, speaking into the church of Jesus Christ that He will come for. It excites me. And so saints, yes, the day of the Lord is at hand. Tribulation is coming, but so is our God who will keep us in Him, Amen. whether by death or by protection. And who you are right now, if you love the Lord, is not who you're going to be when He returns. He will prepare you. It's 9.30, Friday. Many of you are tired. I'm exhausted. <laughs> but I thank you. And let's just uh, hand the meeting back to Pastor Bill, but God bless you. Thank you.